Hi there again, and welcome once more to the Explaining History podcast. Um, I'm very, very pleased to be joined today by Ewan Gibbs, a lecturer in, e in economic and social history at Glasgow University, who's written about um, class history and energy in the UK. Um, it's a uh, both areas which don't get discussed enough, the, have all sorts of kind of interrelated aspects to them. Um, Ewan has a, a book coming out later in the year, I believe, uh, on the subject of the unmaking of the British working class. And this is uh, something that is perennially important and yet almost very rarely kind of discussed, class being this very kind of complicated set of processes. Um, so welcome, Ewan. It's a pleasure to have you today. Yeah, th thanks very much for having me on today, Nick. Okay. Um, and so, so just to begin with, um, when we talk about the idea of the unmaking of class, obviously that, that, that the unmaking of the British working class, that's kind of obviously references E.P. Thompson and the, the making of the, the English working class, I, I guess. Um, and I remember reading E.P. Thompson, him saying, well, he didn't really talk about the Scottish and the Welsh and the Irish working classes because they were their sort of uh, formulation was something completely different. But when we're talking about the unmaking of a British working class, obviously you're you're talking about, you know, the the working classes of the of the of of all of Britain, which is a, a different proposition. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, um, I think that I guess I would also start just by emphasising when I talk about the making and unmaking of class in this form, it's the making and unmaking of a, a conscious force in culture, society and, and politics. Uh, yeah. I'm not meaning to say that Britain is not a society that's marked by class inequalities or, or exploitation today. It clearly strongly is, and arguably more strongly, actually, than, than it was four or five decades ago. Um, when I say the British working class, I quite explicitly mean the working class of Scotland, England and Wales. And I think right. Ireland, as a, including Northern Ireland or the North of Ireland, is a very distinctive set of politics. I would argue sure. that what we see over the late 19th and early 20th century, so in a time period after Thompson who was writing about, as you say, the emergence of a working class in the context of the Industrial Revolution in the late 18th and early 19th century, I think. Importantly, we have the foundations of a political culture that's sometimes referred to as Labourism, where large trade unions representing skilled, but also increasingly workers who are regarded as unskilled, for instance, in coal mines and yeah. docks, in the railways, in factories, come together and articulate an increasingly politicised understanding of class, which for, is founded, I think, very strongly on experiences of workplace exploitation and struggle, but also extends to the conditions of housing and the need for political representation uh, mm -hmm. for the working class. And that, you know, that obviously comes about through, through the Labour Party. But I would stress that you know, foundations in, in culture and daily life are also very important for what it yeah. means to be working class and understandings of class. And, you know, actually share the experiences of music hall, football, cinema attendance are all quite important, I think, for the formation and understanding and articulation of class too. And I think that that extends through youth subcultures across the, the 20th century as well, for yeah. instance. Yeah, and a, a kind of a, an interesting moment occurs uh, probably in the late 50s to the early 1960s where where you have uh, a, a, this dramatic improvement in living standards across the board for, for an awful lot of people. And sort of the, the beginnings of, uh, I suppose, social mobility in ways that it hadn't existed before. Is that a kind of a, a key moment in the unmaking of working class life in Britain? That's a really good question, and my, my book begins in in the 1950s and 1960s for that reason. Right. Um, it was a period that left-wing intellectuals and academics were very exercised and anxious about the future of class. Um, yeah. And partly that was about changes at work. It was about 
the concentration of the industrial working class into large assembly lines and factories and the decline of older sectors like mining and shipbuilding. It was about changes in where these workers and their families lived. Um, yeah. The movement out of inner city, often dilapidated, terrible housing, um, into council housing or, or often privately owned homes, particularly in, in England and Wales, less so in Scotland. Um, was it a moment in the unmaking? I think it's a very interesting moment, and, I, and I'm not convinced that it is a, a cohesive moment of unmaking in a coherent sense. Because I, I think it's worth noting that actually most manual workers continue to vote Labour in Britain in the right. 1960s. Um, arguably, this is actually the period where Labour is as close to ever becoming an actual party of government in Britain. Yeah. Um, the trade union movement is still growing at this point in time. And actually, workers that may have been considered to be middle class or professional workers in the past, particularly in the expanding welfare state, are increasingly likely to join trade unions. And mm -hmm. women workers are, are increasingly likely to do so. And I guess the, one of the questions for us to ask here is how these gains are understood. And where gains and improvements in living standards are understood as products of collective strength, as outcomes of trade union organisation or egalitarian government policies that are implemented through labour movement associated yeah. pressure, I wonder if that, that changes things. Um, I think that's my argument, I think, is that home ownership in this period, for instance, means something quite different to what it comes to mean in the 1980s, 1990s and 2000s, where I think homeowning-based economic identities arguably displace workplace-based ones and, right. and start to reform political interests. Whereas I would argue in the 50s, 60s and 70s, we see wage strikes in Britain that are motivated by workers certainly demanding and expecting more, but they yeah. do that through pursuing forms of collective action which clearly have a very strong class basis to them. Yeah, and of course the the kind of the the divider between those two moments is 1979 and the advent of, of Margaret Thatcher and the 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 use I mean the things like the the sale of council houses. Um, and the, the the use, and I'm not saying this didn't happen before the 1980s, but kind of there's a greater emphasis from the 80s onwards that your your house is some sort of kind of investment tool, um, and that by um, home ownership um, you can um, use it as a kind of a, a, a means of, of generating income in it, in itself, and there's financialization and credit is all all involved in there. Um, is that the kind of thing that you 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 mean there between the, the, those those two conceptions of um of of that relationship between home and class? That, that, I think that, that is a big part of it, but I would also say that before that, I think we also have the older methods not working in the same ways that they had before. You know, working class living standards and incomes stop increasing at the same level that they had done. Yeah, and also the gap. The, you know the the inequalities within the working class, but also between you know a, a larger societal level are growing, who grow dramatically in the nineteen eighties, where they'd actually been closing for decades before that, uh, especially after the Second World War. Um, mm -hmm. So these older methods of of organisation um, cease to be rewarding, and mm -hmm. the second chapter of my book. Is about the strike at the Grunwick Processing Laboratory, which is a very important yeah. moment in British trade union history. It's often remembered for the important involvement of Asian women, uh, of women from uh, Caribbean backgrounds as well, uh, yeah. on, on the picket line. But it was also a really, unfortunately, I think, a very important moment where trade unions were defeated in Britain yeah. and were, were set back. And that, that took place under a Labour government. This was eight years before the 1984-5 minor strike that the strike began. Um, and, and ultimately what you see on that occasion is a firm that is really a service sector firm. So Grumwick is often thought of as a factory. And in some ways it was, but it was a it was a photo processing laboratory. Uh, yeah. 
the, the workers who went on strike uh, uh, initially were workers who worked in a mailroom. So I think yeah. you can compare this in many ways to the form of personal service delivery based work that we think of today through Amazon and other mm-hmm. other companies that I'm sure many of your listeners are you know, use regularly and will be familiar with. And so yeah. we see that it's in sectors like this that are characterized by informal employment and by the exploitation of, of migrant workers often. And, and that's where you see the beginnings of these changes in the distribution of workplace power and the exclusion of trade unions. But then they obviously that spreads out across large sections of the rest of the economy as as it transforms. Um, and you know places that used to be characterised by mining or shipbuilding or car yeah. manufacturing are increasingly characterised by this form of employment. I think that's a that's a really significant background to these changing relationships. To, to asset ownership that, that, that you, you yeah. bring up. And I think that is really, really important. Um, you know, a much hot, a much larger proportion of the UK population are are now landlords and I think are booked in any are grouped in any particular working occupational group. And that that is quite again a striking change in their orientation. Yeah. So yeah, I think that is part of the story as well, for sure. There was a thing I, I just just brought to mind um, when you talk about the the, the the Grenwick strike. I mean, the Grenwick strike was, uh, and this is probably a massive oversimplification, but in part broken by kind of the partisanship of, of small, probably largely middle class right wing groups who yeah. um, did, uh, you know, they probably they were sort of had probably read up on how the general strike was broken. In 1926, there's this great bit in um, David Edgerton's book, um, The Rise and Fall of the British Nation. I think we just put it very succinctly. He said, by about the mid 1970s, a group of the middle class had had enough and um, kind of essentially decided they were going to go to war against um, what they viewed as this sort of like creeping progressivism and um, the, the 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 power the the, the power of unions and 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 uh, the um, and, and that what they viewed as this kind of amorphous left in in the mid nineteen seventies. Do you think that um, the that you know the, the, at that period of time the term kind of class war sort of applies at all? I know it's it's a term that gets thrown around, but it, would would that be right around Grenwick? I think I think that's a very important observation, and uh, I think that you know one of the important ideas that. Ralph Miliband put forward in his analysis of, of labourism and the rebuilding of British society in the second half of the 20th century was the idea of class struggles from above. Yeah. Um, now, obviously, the kind of archetypal moment for that is the, the minor strike in 1984-5, and, you know, we're marking the 40th anniversary of that this year. But I think, actually, events like Brunwick... Although Grumwick was quite spectacular, it also exemplified larger processes that were going on in British society in the 70s and gave them a focal point. So I think you're exactly correct that we did have these right-wing pressure groups, one of which was called the Middle Class Association. So that's pretty, uh, on the, you know, uh, quite a clear uh, demonstration <laughs> of, of the interest that thought it represented. Um, the most uh, influential one was known as the, the National Association for Freedom. Uh, yeah. which gives us another indication of its sort of li- nominally libertarian right-wing orientation. But obviously, it's a form of libertarianism for property owners um, yeah. and employers, not libertarianism for workers or people that no. want to exercise the rights of citizenship in their no. workplaces. And that, that had been the agenda of the labour movement, I think, in the 20th century, it was to make the workplace a legitimate space yeah. Uh, for the exercise of political and economic democracy. And I think you're exactly right of what you see in the 1970s. That was a very vociferous pushback against that. Now, I think that begins in the 60s and 70s. And something that I'm actually quite resistant to is the idea that there was this period of cosy consensus that the Conservative Party agreed with. I think that actually what we have is an organised labour movement that is powerful and influential and organised the strategic parts of the economy, including around the production of energy, very importantly, um, mm-hmm. which means that it's able to win and maintain very important concessions. But you're right that certainly 
by the mid 70s but even before that Heath was elected on the agenda of confronting trade unions in 1970 so galvanizing these sorts of sections of society that we're talking about um yeah and that that those those sections have become increasingly frustrated with levels of inflation which they blame on organized labor and i think I think we can dispute whether organised labour was the cause of inflation in the 1970s, but that's the, the political story that's yeah. told. And when you have scenes like the picket lines at Grunwick and, you know, scenes of it, really quite graphic police violence, actually. Mm. Nevertheless, the story that, that broadcasts from that is a story about chaos and disorder. So you have a sense of disorder in the streets disorder in workplaces and disorder in people's bank balances. And I think that is very, very important for informing the agenda that, that Margaret Thatcher takes forward in the late 70s and through the 1980s. An agenda that it is worth thinking about in, in class terms that I think does have a strong basis in the middle class, especially, you know, the petty bourgeois small employer section. Um but also when they support, I think, in some elements of the working class um, that become themselves dissociated from what they see as, as, as a bureaucratic society and they want to realise some of the benefits of, of the market economy, uh, particularly yeah. Yeah. increasing home ownership. And that's the, the kind of, uh, to use that, so it's particularly unfortunate and particularly kind of, almost sort of prejudicial term, this kind of Essex man that Thatcher um, believed existed, this sort of kind of working class, quite entrepreneurial, um, does his own thing, wants to own his own house, wants to have nice holidays, wants to be part of consumer society, um, and kind of is fed up with being, uh, you know, and this is the Tory narrative, fed up with being, um, you know, told to adhere to closed shop practices uh, in the union and, and and stuff like that, and it's where this argument of and it's the 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 kind of like the Tory conception of freedom um, comes under under Thatcher, it's, which is as you said, it's freedom freedom for capital to do what it wants. By and is, that is is the point, um, but it's also the the kind of the, 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 this argument that and it's again it's like a. Um, a uh, 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 an argument from like Hayek and things like that, that one has to be free from collectivism to really kind of be yourself and to experience this, this magical liberty. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's right. And I think when we think about the Essex man and we start to deconstruct it a bit, we, we come on to something actually that's really quite important, which is the skilled manual male workers were the central organising cohort of the, the British Labour movement in, in the late 19th and then through the first half of the 20th century. And then, you know, Essex Man represents a, a quite considerable change in the cultural stereotype of what it means to be a, a skilled tradesman in Britain in, in many respects. Um, and, you know, there's complications there because actually lots of skilled trade workers don't run their own businesses. They, they work for the electricity generating board or they work in shipyards or on building sites in and, and different ways and or in large industrial firms. But um, I think if we look at things like electoral polling data, we do really see that, that that is a crucial group whose allegiances switch and after the night, from the 1940s to the 1970s, uniquely in its history, the majority of manual workers in Britain vote Labour and they cease to do so after that. And I think that is quite important for thinking about the coherence and articulation of working class political consciousness and, and identity and, and what that means. And after that, um, the coalitions that make up the parties. Are, are, are given some different complexions. So, for instance, being affiliated with the public sector becomes more important to vote in Labour, probably. Um, yeah. And that, that becomes associated with, you know, the as you say, this idea about freedom and what it means to be entrepreneurial, what it means to, to have that sort of um, private sector south of England orientation. I mean, the other thing I wouldn't downplay here I think is uh, 
the politicisation of of race and, and, and nationality in this context, and clearly, sure. Thatcherism is also strongly associated with that. Now, so has Labourism been, and so has working class politics in Britain. Now, I don't think we should because you know we shouldn't because we are of the left or of a certain political right. orientation downplay the significance of that either. That actually. <laughs> British Labour movement politics is strongly nationalist and is able to to organise its vision of what a national industrial economy looks like quite successfully in many respects between the 40s and the 70s. But that that momentum shifts considerably in the 80s, 90s and then the 2000s. And obviously to the extent that what we have by the 2000s and 2010s is a an articulation of a supposed sort of working class politics on the right. Yeah, and you know, without going off into to, to to you know talking about Brexit, which is a whole other kind of can of worms. But again, one of the the, the David Edgerton argument is that you have this after nineteen forty five, you have the transition from a, an imperial state to a national state. We we lose the empire, and then. The economic and social and political orientation of governments up to 1979 are about developing, you know, uh, Britain as as a, a unitary nation, um, and then with it's all its sort of European com- complex relationships with Europe. After 1979, he argues the the kind of this sort of neoliberal experience that we've we've been through of. Um, Increasingly, kind of a globalized economy and globalized labor force and all that. He says has sort of downgraded the concept of the nation, and Brexit was some kind of huge convulsion against that. Um, this, this, deti- this desire to reclaim some sort of national identity in this kind of incoherent way. I mean, is is what has happened? If his thesis is correct, and I think it's a very compelling one. Does it, is that does that fit in with how you see what has happened to the working class in Britain? Yeah, I think a lot of it does. Um, I think that the first chapter of my book, which looks at that experience of affluence in the national industrial economy and the replanning of of, of uh, Britain's economic base in the fifties, sixties, and seventies, I think strongly aligns with that idea of the industrial nation. That, that Edgerton articulates. I think I'd go a bit stronger in, in, in underlining, I think, how, how central the Labour movement was to that idea of the industrial nation and to the specific organisations that are, in my view, crucial to it. So I look at workers, miners in the National Cobalt and electricity generating workers, so workers concentrated in power stations but also in the supply system. And, and I argue their sense of themselves and their relationship to British society is strongly shaped by the fact that they work in public enterprises that have been given this very prominent role in mm. the reconstruction of Britain and then sustaining an affluent society. Um, and their their frustrations in the late 60s and early 70s become about the fact that their wages are not keeping pace with, say, car workers and other workers in, in areas of the private sector because they think and argue politically and economically convincingly successfully ultimately in the course of industrial action that their 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 work is absolutely central to the industrial nation. Yeah. Um, I guess where where I'd want to put some more details in and, and think about some of the, the idea of the fractures and challenges are, you know, in the nineteen sixties though, even at that peak moment of, of Labourism as I've described it, we also have I think three very different or linked but important challenges uh, that come are connected to the end of the old imperial nationhood. I think as well. So, you know, in, in nineteen over the sixty six, sixty seven, sixty eight, we have Plaid Cymru and the SNP winning by elections in yeah. important, uh, usually Labour voting working class constituencies, industrial constituencies, and we also have. You know, Powell's rivers of blood speech, and uh, you know, it's given in the English Midlands, and results in uh, a, a movement of of support from industrial workers, primarily concentrated in, in the Midlands in the south of England. So, while I I think that that reading of what fuels 
you know, support from the far right in the twenty first century, um, primarily, but not only in, in England and to some extent in Wales, I guess, is accurate. I think it does have antecedents. Yeah. And you know, the, and there, there's important anticipations there that, that I think yeah. we need to take seriously. I mean, the other side of that is thinking through particularly the work of Satnam Verdi and other scholars is actually, to some extent, that that wave of working class activism on the right is also defeated by working class activism on the left and unsuccessful anti-racism. And that, that yeah. anti-racism activism, anti-fascist activism, that's important in the 1970s too. And to making sure that, you know, what working class politics look like and understood is, is, is contested, therefore. And it's, it's being contested again. And um, it's clearly being contested in the 21st century too. Well, I mean, and this is, I suppose, the final thing to say is, is that I suppose kind of the definition of class, or, you know, working class, middle class, what have you, is always, it's always a battlefield. It's always kind of, you know, what, what, what it is is always kind of uh, contested. I think one of the key areas of of, of contestation uh, in the last ten years has been the idea of, of a white working class, and yeah. obviously, um, you know the, the 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 working class that probably most people encounter most of the time is kind of a service class. You know, none of us are wandering through factories really, but we are, you know, um, getting things delivered to our doors, getting taxis, being served in restaurants, that kind of thing. And the service, the service working class is very, very, you know, um, very, very cosmopolitan. It's, it's not a white working class. And um, I think that, um, that, 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 that certainly that's not what seems to be articulated by any of our major parties. They've been to be very fixated on talking about a white working class. Yeah, I think that's a important a really important point. Um, and I think that my last chapter is titled The White Working Class um, because it's about 2000 and the 2010s where we see, I think, particularly through the vote for the BNP in the 2000s and then subsequently you kept them Brexit. But also another moment that I'm really keen to think about actually is, is is the Lindsay oil refinery strike in 2009 um, which was a somewhat complicated industrial dispute but I'm more interested in the way it was politicised and commented on than, than actually the course of the dispute because I think it reveals changes in how class was thought about and being discussed in Britain at that time so the dispute was was around the, the use of um, workers from Southern Europe who were seen to be replacing uh, British workers and being employed on poorer conditions that didn't meet national trade union agreements. Um, mm-hmm. And there was a there was a walkout unofficially at, at Lindsay um, and certainly some of the trade union leaders, the activists that were involved saw themselves as left-wing socialists. Um, but nevertheless, there was... And there were walkouts at other large sites, including our oil refineries in Scotland and Wales. Um, it was picked up by the Daily Star, who became quite vociferous supporters of it, and who applied the, the, the slogan British jobs for British workers to it, which Gordon Brown had already um, said not a few months before as Prime Minister, I think. And... You know, I think that this coincides with the, the rising electoral popularity of the BNP and it gives a definite ratio and I think also gender, actually, yeah. complexion to to what class means in Britain. And it also starts, I think, or at least encourages that idea that class is about small towns maybe rather than cities. Think about where these... Uh, Yes. Well, these sites tend to be, they're not in the large urban centres where, the, as you commented on, you know, that cosmopolitan service working class is maybe more concentrated. Yeah. Um, so I think you're right. I think that's a real, and I think, it, you know, it's useful to think about the different moments where that was consolidated. I think Lindsay is especially interesting because I've, I've never known of other incidents of uh essentially wildcat workplace militancy being endorsed by a tabloid newspaper before. Um, 
And it, and it says something about the confidence that actually the, the Daily Star felt when it came to like ideas about class and how safely it felt they could put them on the right at that point in time, perhaps, that they felt able to do that. Yeah. You, you may, of course, be kind of overestimating the amount of thinking that was going on at all. I mean, that's, that's <laughs> one that possibility. No, um, I, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I don't. I don't think these are. I don't think, for the most part, these are conscious strategies. I think they're more indicators or indications of the historical trajectories at certain points in time. Yes, I completely agree. So we must finish in a a, a moment, Ewan. It's been an absolute pleasure to um to chat with you today. When is the book coming out? I, I hopefully. You know, well. <laughs> You were slightly optimistic when you said later this year. I'm, I'm hoping to submit my manuscript by early, some point early next year, by this time next year. But uh, having worked through the editorial processes of the books before, I, I, I can't promise it'll be on shelves uh, anytime soon. But I, I hope it's been, I hope this trailer's been uh, interesting to your readers. I, will, uh, I hope, I, I'm sure it will be. And when it is um, available, I hope you'll come back and we can talk about it some uh, more. Very, very happy to do that. Okay. It's a real pleasure to chat with you today, Ian. All the very best. Thanks a lot. Thank